Hello. I have what I hope you'll find is an interesting video for you today. So this morning, my two daughters and I left Halifax bright and early to travel to Kenzieville, Nova Scotia, about a two-hour drive, to attend a wild edibles foraging class hosted by Cliff Surrentine. I was able to get some video, and as Cliff led us through the fields and through the woods around his property, and he was identifying some wild edibles for us and also telling us how to prepare them. I got a bit of an interview with Cliff at the end. I hope you enjoy the video. The oxide daisy is another one of those many plants in the Asteraceae family. And if I remember my taxonomy correctly, each one of these will look like a petal is a separate flower. Each one of these sections in the middle that looks like, uh, oh, where is it slipping my mind for the center of a flower? What is it? I'm trying to recall. Okay. Well, anyway, each one of these little things in here is also an individual flower. But what's important about the oxide daisy, I've heard rumors you can pickle these flowers, by the way. Daphne and I are going to try. We're trying that soon. She's picking some of the boxes. We'll see how that goes. But what we like are the leaves. Unfortunately, on the flowering stem, the leaves are not very big, but they are always big. So those are the They are always good. Two different types of fungi and a bacteria. There are thousands and thousands in the world, and uh, most of them are not even fully documented at this time, not even close. In fact, it was just a year or two ago they discovered that lichens are actually comprised of two fungi and a bacteria. Um, <clears throat> there are only two poisonous types of lichens known, and they're both orangish red, so just avoid those if you're thinking about using lichens. And I'll tell you up front, I'm not an expert in, in, in uh, lichens, so as we come across them, apart from Usnea, I really can't tell you what they are. But I do use them frequently because they all share in common that they all have medicinal usages. Um, if you could figure out an, an energy efficient way, if you could figure out an energy efficient way to uh, extract that uh, plant cell out of there, you could actually get food uses out of them too. But they all have medicinal uses. This is one of the reasons I, I did a video recently where I started to talk about medicinal stuff and I'm so used to, you know, teaching courses and talking with bushcrafters and such. I'd always think in terms of kits and I started to say, at so, you know, in, in, in my kit when I'm in the bush, well, I always carry stuff like this, and I stuff. I can't really take care of a kit, because the truth is I just grab what I need when I need it. There's all kinds of stuff everywhere. You use for everything from food to medicine if you need it. But <clears throat> the usnea um, here is one that's easily recognized by people, and they recognize it because they often see it on trees that look like they're dying. By the way, usnea doesn't kill trees. Don't feel like you need to eradicate it. Usnea is not why your tree is dying if you have a tree that's sick. It's if the tree is too moist, if it's under a fun fungal attack maybe, there's something else that's going on. And the usnea, what happens is it just moves, if the bark is starting to break down, the usnea moves in and it begins to break down that bark. But it's only breaking down dead bark and it's digesting that material. It doesn't attack nor does it even weaken the tree. Um, what you can do with this stuff is in a pinch, you can chew this stuff up or grind it up or, um, and uh, with a stone, uh, or if you want to pre-prep it at the house, you can take it and mash it up really, really fine with any type of mashing equipment and put it in some lard and then you have a poultice there. But when I need it, I don't like to carry it. I like to avoid as much weight as possible when I'm in the bush. So what I'll do is I just chew this stuff up if I need it, if I have a cut or a gash or whatnot, chew it up and place it on there. And um, I drink every day. I drink um, about a quarter of a liter of tea made from chaga, turkey tails, Ganoderma mushrooms and uh, some other odds and ends, I just don't get infections anymore. I, haven't, I can't even remember the last time I had so much as a cold. I used to get fever blisters twice a year in spring and autumn like a lot of people do. I don't get them anymore. Um, you know, um, I remember a couple of years back, I, I woke up one morning, I'd been seeing somebody that had a bad flu, woke up one morning and started to feel like I was getting it. I just had twice the amount of the tea in the morning. A couple hours later, it was gone. All the symptoms were gone. I just don't get sick. But um, so, I'm not too worried about getting infections is where I'm going with this, but what I'll do is I'll chew this up and I just, if I have reason, if I have concerns that, you know, like maybe I scratch myself on something dirty, muddy, whatnot, and I'm worried about infection, I'll put that on there. And uh, that's pretty well going to clear up the infection. Now, there are lots of other things in these woods that are going to clear up infection, like Ganoderma mushrooms, um, sphagnum moss, the, the slimy goop in between the layers of cattails. There's lots and lots of things we, that one can find in the woods to use for medicine. But since this is ubiquitous, you can find it almost anywhere. It is a really good one to do, or to know. And all you have to do to use it is just put it in your mouth and chew on it. It doesn't even taste all that bad. That's like kind of a tart taste. You chew on it. I'm not gonna chew it until it's a paste, because it's gonna take a bit. But you just make a paste out of it like that. 
rub it around the wound, and then fold it right on the wound. And you're good to go. Wow, that's almost like an orange. <laughs> so the way you really identify and work with the ostrich ferns, and it, by and large, it's a typical fern. Um, however, the other ferns will have these brown papery flakes that will grow up and down the leaf petioles. And ostrich ferns only get the flakes Here's the, here's the, the fiddlehead. You only get the flakes on either side of the fiddlehead, those papery flakes. And those papery flakes are very fragile. With the slightest gust of wind, they're going to fall off so oftentimes. In fact, usually you don't even find the papery flakes on the side of the ostrich ferns. As um, the ferns don't have any hair, like the uh, interrupted ferns have a silvery sheen, kind of like a hair on them. And uh, the ostrich fern is at no time in its life bitter. It gets too tough to eat like it is right now, but it's never bitter. Also, very distinctively, at least with the ferns around here, I'm not sure about ferns out west if any of them have these concavities, but ostrich ferns have a distinctive concavity running down the petiole, like celery, in miniature. And that is, that's very, that's entirely diagnostic. None of the other ferns have that. The closest is they have very slight declensions that are just barely there, running down the top of the petiole. But the ostrich ferns have a very distinct celery-like concavity running down the petiole. Now, we're going to see if we can find any part of this that's still meristematic. So it's still a little tender here, but I mean, it's not going to be great. But in a pinch, you could eat this out in the woods. This is still a growing area, and it's still tender. It's never going to be bitter. Some of the things that you read say that um, you have to be sure to cook ostrich ferns. I don't honestly know where that comes from. Plants will tend to purify any water and things that go into them, and we put it raw on our salad sometimes. Maybe if you live in areas where there's dirty farms and stuff around us. You know, one of the risks that you find around farmland, if you're harvest, harvesting within proximity of farmland, if they raise livestock, um, the manure out in the fields can dry, and become a dust, and settle on it. That can transfer diseases. So yes, this one feels soft, so it's probably still good. Now, you can see how cool it is. I got, I got enough how I figured I could demo it. It's, you can't predict how big these things are. It, it depends really on the softness of the soil. It might have been that much longer. I've dug them up and they've gone that much further down. But oftentimes, if the ground is soft, they hit a rock, they'll turn sideways and you just have to kind of observe and feel them out as you go along. And then, if you get a place where you have nice, black, rich soil, I've seen these things get as big as my wrist even as big as my, my upper arm, and, and they can weigh several pounds. So there's a lot of variety with burdock, but around here, because the ground is so rocky, you just don't ever really get big, very big ones. But what you do with these, yeah. you're gonna peel away this outer skin, and you'll see that nice white flesh underneath. This is why you need a knife with a sharp back not to activate shirt <laughs> and stuff, but it's going to take any piece of steel and do that. It's to quickly feel, feel stuff in this one, at least if you're a cord, because that's what we do with the backs of knives. It's very quick and handy for that. I thought there was a fat wood. Alrighty. And this part up in here, this many is uses. what you would eat. Many uses. Oh, wow, this is a nice first year one. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do what I do. <laughs> And it is, the flavor is very much like potato. Now, as they mature, they become fibrous. So usually, they don't become fibrous until quite late. So I'm here with Cliff Serentine, and Cliff is running a school here on his property, and one of the courses is Foraging for Wild Edibles, the level one course, and that's what we are doing today. So I'm just gonna ask Cliff to talk a little bit about his school, and what he does here, and, uh, oh yeah, I'll just turn it over to you, Cliff. All right. Well, the school is designed to teach people how to live in the woods and I emphasize how to live in the woods long term because that's what my wife and I have done most of our lives. We've lived in the woods, um, whether it was the bayous in the deep south or the Alaskan bush where we lived in the remote areas for an extended period of time or here, here where we've lived for the last 12 years. Um, so we cover not just bushcraft skills, but homestead skills and also skills that could be construed as uh, wilderness survival. Um, and even long-term essential life skills like Daphne this summer is doing a course on ancient methods of preserving food. Oh, very cool. 
Um, she just finished doing a course on how to make cheese using local ingredients and such. And we make our own milk for our cheese from our goats and such. Um, from my end of things, I tend to cover the more bush oriented things. So sometimes I do work with things like organic gardening. So I try to emphasize uh, balanced living. So we do a lot of courses, food foraging. Um, I've offered tracking courses for a while, but Nova Scotians never seem to be interested in tracking, which is kind of perplexing to me because, you know, when deer season rolls around, I told them my thumbs so I'm ready to go get a deer, then I find a deer's trail and track it down, and I got me to get a deer every year. Sometimes I get two if I want two. Um, tracking helps, and it's, it's a great way to understand the natural mm -hmm. world, and that is yeah. also a big part of what we're about, is really understanding the natural world. Um, as opposed to just using it as a resource, we teach right. the courses to teach people how to live in it, how to live respectfully and live well with it. So our courses emphasize things. At the end of many of my videos, I have a slogan, you know, go softly, gently, and leave no trace. That's really what we're about. You can live very well and live out there in, in the green and, and uh, get an additional benefit of life, but you do need a number of skills to do it, skills that we picked up for, with our lives in the remote wilderness. And um, whether you choose to train horses or raise livestock or garden or go out in the woods and forage your food, we, we cover those types right, of things. Right. Yeah, for me, these are the skills that, that are at the heart of the essence of what bushcraft really should be, or really is meant to be. So, so Cliff, where can people find out more about your workshops? Website. I have a YouTube channel, and um, you just go to YouTube and type in my name, or you can go to Google and type in Cliff Sarantino and pull up my website as well. And I'll add links to that on the show notes for this video as well. All right. Thank you very much, Cliff. Certainly. It's been a wonderful day. Glad you enjoyed it. Very much. I'll be back. Okay. So, the, uh, <laughs> so I'm here with two of the participants of Cliff Surrentine's Wild Foraging class, his basic class, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and tell us what brought them here and what they're taking away from the course. So, go ahead. I'm Melissa Castagni. Robert Castagni. Um, I guess what brought me here was just to further my knowledge. One of the things I'm strongly lacking is foraging skills. I mean, I know a handful of things, never knew the names of them. Uh, just knew I could eat them, but uh, no. Taken from here, I learned a lot of things that I was told I couldn't eat, I can eat. Yeah, yeah, so. cool, yeah. uh, for me, a lot of it's the medicinal kind of applications, especially for poultices and uh, uh, teas, uh, anything that kind of has uh, an impact on on the body system, so it's just, we learned a lot about that stuff today, so that was really great, yeah. So would you come back? Yeah, for sure, definitely through the different maturation cycles of the plants. Right. It'd yeah. be really great to see, like, where they're at in different stages of their life cycle, so, yeah, great. yeah. Right. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah, thank Take you. Care. All right. All right. So I'm here with my daughter, Megan, who's visiting from Vancouver, and Megan came along with me to see Cliff Surrentine's wild foraging class, his level one class, and Megan, why did you come to this course? Well, uh, before I came out to Halifax to visit, Dad told me all about it, and I thought it would be a nice family experience to come out and also spend some time outdoors in Nova Scotia because I haven't been able to do that in a while. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So would you come back if you had the opportunity? I would, yeah. I learned some really cool things about mushrooms and about some of the plants. Um, a lot of it was over my head, but it was a cool beginner's experience, so i definitely do it again. Cool, great. Thank you. <laughs> so there we have it. That was a wonderful day in the woods with my two daughters and Cliff Serentine and a group of people doing some wild foraging. And it's something that you can do not just, you don't have to come to workshops like this, but just get out in the woods and look around and find things and discover and explore. That's what it's all about, really. So do that. Get out and explore. And while you're out there, take that path less traveled. It will make all the difference. Bye for now.